This is a talk about nature and nurture, how evolution works. And we've, mankind has this view for a long time that it's all in our genetic material, it's in our genes. Well, that's true, and it's still true, but it doesn't work exactly as we had thought. It's not near as mechanistic. And the concept of epigenetics has been um, a passion of mine for the last five years. I, I see a lot of implications for society. We just need people to be aware of it. I am not an expert on any of this. I am an advocate for the concepts that are in the Urantia book, and I'm an advocate for what's <clears throat> in the epigenetic uh, studies that are coming out. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. I uh, am part of the Urantia University, and I don't want this to be confused with a lecture that of the quality that the Urantia University will be giving. But it is of my deepest interest that the Urantia University will take up subjects just like this and really do deep studies. And I'm going to keep taking this one and pushing it until I can turn it over to somebody with the right credibility and research ability to further this really out. Now, things like these topics of nature, you have mechanistic biology, you have natural selection, you have survival of the fittest, you have a concept called direct inheritance. We'll see. You have chromosomes. You have Darwin and all of his thoughts. You have just the term genetics. You write this down? Yeah. <laughs> 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 we'll memorize it. Most of us actually know more about the concept of nature. We've been taught it in our schools. And while it's going through rapid changes, it's still valid um, today. Yeah. The sins of the fathers and their fathers. How true is that statement? I want you to contemplate it just for a second. Are the sins of the father put on to, the, to the, our children? Yeah. We know on a spiritual side that is not true. But in the world of the supreme, in this evolutionary process that we're going through, go ahead and click that, what happens to this planet because of what we do definitely affects our children's children. If we destroy our oceans, it will be those that survive in the future that do have to deal with it. So in a sense, the sins of the father and their fathers is true. And it affects us in many ways with our genetic material. But the genetics don't, doesn't change. The genome stays very solid for, for um, tens of thousands of years before there's any recognizable changes. But epigenetically, this word that we need a definition for, is a concept that deals with how does the culture affect the gene, the environment. Remember uh, Lamarck? Remember hearing about Lamarck when you studied evolution? And uh, Lamarck, his big thing was is that the environment can affect animals and make them physically change. So that the giraffe is one of his examples, constantly trying to reach up to bite the leaves, the neck just continued to grow. Now he was uh, soundly refuted, and yet what we're learning now is very Lamarckian-like. Uh, you have a concept called social inheritance that we're going to talk a little bit more about. And we have a transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. This is something we should be taking a particular interest in by the habits that we have or our children have before they have children. For it again. There it is. Okay, the Urantia book makes some statements, and they don't, the Urantia book doesn't follow right in step with everything that um, epigenetics is coming up with. But it's amazing where it's, where it's going. Robert, hold the microphone closer. Close. Okay. okay, thanks. So, in paper 68, civilization is a racial acquirement. It is not biologically inherent. Hence, must all children be reared in an environment of culture, while each succeeding generation of youth must receive anew its education. The superior qualities of civilization, scientific, philosophic, and religious, 
are not transmitted from one generation to another by direct inheritance. These cultural achievements are preserved only by the enlightened conservation of social inheritance. Now, it's saying two things here. Get back to my page of notes. One of them is it's talking about direct inheritance. And the other one is social inheritance. And what's interesting here is they don't give us a real definition of it. I couldn't find anything in the Rancho book that further define what they mean by direct inheritance. So we have to kind of just take it from what the word itself is saying. And by direct inheritance, it's if we um, have certain habits, by direct inheritance, those habits are not going to be passed on. But what epigenetic studies will do, have shown, is that they are passed on through a social inheritance. And you're going to see some, we're going to watch a little some video clips, and I have some pictures that are going to start bringing this a little closer to a better understanding. Oh, Robert? Yes? Could you define epigenetics? I'm going to. <laughs> I'm keeping you thinking about it. <laughs> Wetting the appetite. <laughs> now, lure. Let's see, this was um, a report that was done, and you're going to love the name of it. Again, get pencils and pens out, because I'm sure you're going to want to run out and find this one. It was written by uh, Chilanka and Roz, and it's uh, Transgenerational Epigenetic Inheritance, Prevalence, Mechanisms, and Implications for the Study of Heredity and Evolution. That's the title. Just, just the first four <laughs> words. Just the first four words. Trans Transgenerational, Transgenerational Epigenetic Inheritance. Okay. And what they came up with was recent findings have confirmed important examples of heritable changes that cannot be explained by the direct agency of the DNA molecule. These phenomena are, are classed as epigenetic inheritance systems that are casually or independently evolving over genes. Research into modes and mechanisms of epigenetic inheritance is still in its scientific infancy. However, this area of research has attracted much recent activity as it broadens the scope of heritability and evolutionary biology in general. Now, this was in 2009. The concept of epigenetic, as we're starting to define it, and you'll get that term here real quick, is really only about 15 years old. And honestly, it's really about the uh, 2000. It was after the Genome Project created so many questions that we started looking a little bit deeper, and what we find is quite amazing. But before I move on to the further explanation, I came across a blog. And while I'm not sure I would agree with this gentleman's, um, all of his political views, he asked some really cool questions. It made me think. And in one of them, he's asking, what options does a person born into poverty have of leaving it behind? And will children of substance abusers themselves turn to drugs? To whom does the responsibility of getting out of an unwanted life situation belong? The affected individual or the government? Now, that really raises a lot of interesting issues there. I became a part of uh, free schools world literacy because I firmly believe that by helping these young girls learn to be literate changes them, and I know it does epigenetically, and changes their environment. And that slowly they can pull themselves out of some of the issues that they're dealing with. Not all, but some. In 1690, uh, a really ridiculous law in Scotland came down called uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, no, it was, um, everybody had to, it was a literacy law, and everybody had to read the Bible, period. And so any village had to create a, a school, and young or old had to read. In 10 years, Scotland became one of the most literate, still very poor, but one of the most literate countries in the world. That was Scotland? Scotland. And it, it was an amazing process because they only wanted people to read the Bible. And after people began to read, they started reading all types of things. And the explosion of, 
of scientific thought, of humanities, was amazing in the 1700s. In just 10 years, they made a huge, now they, it was a decree that was forced. Now, that was a huge social epigenetic change. Their brains started to become rewired by the very act of having to learn, as you'll see a little bit more here. Uh, go ahead and click that. Now, I might have to help you, because this is a movie. My name is Bruce Lipton and I'm a former research scientist. Uh, my history was based on cloning stem cells. A lot of people think stem cells are a, a new understanding in science, but I was cloning stem cells 43 years ago in 1967. And through my research, I found a different path in understanding medicine and health uh, with a different uh, view on genetics, uh, which is now called epigenetics, the new science. In school, most people learn the science of genetics, which is the belief that genes control our traits. Uh, this science is uh, really based on the fact that we get our genes from our mother and father at the moment of conception, and that these genes at that moment of conception actually will determine the rest of our lives in regard to our physical, emotional, and behavioral characteristics. A new science is called epigenetics. And epigenetics is an understanding that genes are not self-actualizing, meaning genes do not turn on and off. Genes are just blueprints. And the significance of that is that in order to engage a blueprint, it's not the blueprint's activity, it's the contractor's activity, the one who reads the blueprint that controls the blueprint. So in epigenetics, it's a science of how environmental information selects the genes and can modify the readout of the genes. And this becomes very significant because in genetic control, the old story, we are victims of our genetics. And the new story, epigenetics, because we can change the readout of the genes, we can then become masters of our genetic. Uh, and this becomes important because we actually control our health with our beliefs, our perceptions, and our attitudes about life. In the world of science that I grew up in, the, the mechanisms of how life worked were based on what we call Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics is a science that emphasizes the material physical world. So according to Newtonian physicists, if you look at a body, it's like a machine made out of chemicals and controlled by genes. And therefore, we look at the nature of the physical activity of the body uh, in regard to its chemistry as controlling its life and its functions. However, there's been a change in our understanding of mechanisms. And rather than the Newtonian physics, this information has been updated by what we call quantum physics. Quantum physics recognize that although we see an atom as a physical structure, when quantum physicists wanted to find out what the atom was made out of, when they looked inside, rather than finding physical particles, they found that the atom was made out of vibrational energy. And all of a sudden, when you understand this, if matter is made out of energy, then everything in the universe is made out of energy. And therefore, uh, it becomes important to understand that energy is very powerful in influencing what we call matter. So Newtonian physics says matter can only be influenced by other matter. And quantum physics says no, matter can be influenced by the invisible energy fields. And therefore, a new kind of healing is available to us using energy vibration rather than physical chemicals. And it turns out that energy vibration as a means of communication is a hundred times more efficient than trying to communicate with the body through chemistry. So we have a new understanding of how to control our body, and it's through energy fields and vibrations, which include thoughts. In the world that we live in, which is based on Newtonian physics, where matter is primary, and you mix this with an understanding from Darwinian theory that we're in a competition for fitness and survival, and I would ask a person in this world, and I say, well, how do I know how fit you are? And in this world, you say, well, I am very fit because I have this much matter, because matter represents the world, and the more fitness you have, the more matter you have. Matter, in our case, is represented by money, because that's what you buy the matter with. So the more money you have in this world, then according to the Darwinian principle, then the more fitness you express. 
But in a world based on quantum physics, which is based on energy, then there are things that are much more important than the physical realm. And some of the things that we understand in the nature of energy are emotions and feelings, uh, such as love and beauty. These are expressions of energy. And in a world of quantum physics, we start to recognize that this is more important than the actual physical possessions. So as we move from this world into the future world on quantum physics, we will surely emphasize more the nature of love and feelings and energy and beauty and harmony over the money and the material expressions that we look at today. Science has revealed to us a very disturbing fact that uh, the biosphere is, is falling apart, that uh, life is undergoing what they refer to as a mass extinction. We're losing species of animals and plants faster than ever in history. Five previous mass extinctions have been recognized, but they were due to things like comets or asteroids hitting the Earth and destroying the environment. But science has recognized that the mass extinction we're facing today is actually due to human behavior. It says that the way we are treating the planet, the way that we are treating each other, is disrupting the ecosphere and actually creating a situation of our own extinction. And therefore, it says that in order for us to survive, we must change the way we are living and behaving on this planet. And in order to do that, we have to change the fundamental beliefs. So it's very interesting to recognize that the world is now in a state of change, that the institutions that have brought us up to this part in our history are now falling apart. While this scares many people, I really want people to recognize an important point. It's the current institutions of today that are carrying the beliefs that are causing our own extinction. That in order for us to survive, the system has to fall. We have to have a crash of the system so that we can build a new sustainable system to support our vitality and support the planet to keep us alive. And why this is important is I want people to recognize, do not be afraid of the changes that are coming because these changes are necessary for us to leave behind the destructive beliefs that we've been operating by so that we can create a better world through new beliefs and new institutions that support humanity and the environment and Mother Nature. is to add to his thoughts about um, mind. Because he had the energy, he had the physical, but he had nothing in there that was pulling in the power of mind. And we in the Arantia movement know a lot about the mind circuits. That's so important. But see if you can hit that and that will uh, there. So social inheritance. <coughs> is nurture, that, that is epigenetics. And we're gonna dig now into epigenetics from this point forward. And it's changing the way that we view inheritance traits, but what has become known as a form of cell memory outside <coughs> the gene. So to, to, to begin this understanding of what epigenetics is, it is things that are happening on the outside of the gene that influences what it can and cannot do. Even though it has the power to do it, this will allow it to, to express itself more or to express itself less. Can you click that for me? Right, again, pens and paper, get your memory out. This is where, this is as scientific as I'm going to get. But it's necessary for you to grab some of these ideas. And I think that it's a little smaller than I thought, so I don't think you can read a lot of that in the back. But, what we have is the epigenetic mechanisms, and there's the environmental chemicals. There's our development in childhood and in the womb. There's drugs and pharmaceuticals. There's the process of aging that has epigenetic effects to us. There's our diet. What I'd like to add there that they don't have would be um, our, our interest in loving service, our interest in music, the, the arts, science, all of these become epigenetic changes. Cultures that deeply value mathematics, like a Korean. Koreans really uh, admire and, 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 and uh, uphold the importance of mathematics. And you'll find that mathematics is very good in that culture. 
because it's being reinforced generation after generation. Anything in a culture that's reinforced, be it good or bad, smoking cigarettes, um, eating lots of sugar, watching violence on TV, and if that is happening to you before you had children, that has an epigenetic effect that can be passed on, and now you, you reinforce it by letting your children watch it, and then they have children, and pretty soon you have what it would be called epigenetic trends. Now, to get just to a little bit of the science, I mean, you don't really need to, oh, didn't need to do that. Can you go back? There. I meant to push this button here. The main things that are going to happen with an epigenetic function is that it is a group, methyl groups are probably the main ones, but there's uh, phosphorization and oxalization, and they all do different things. But when you finally get down to where our genes are, our genes are wrapped around these um, histones. And what this does, what a histone does, is allows the amount of expression that a gene is going to have. When a gene opens up like this, see the space between? Now that gene is open for proteins to be produced and to interact. But when it's tight like this, that, that part of the DNA, that gene, is inactive. And what is going to open and close these and make them apart is these little tails. And depending on what type of an epigenetic marker marks that, will determine how open or closed that is. So let me give a few examples. Um, of some, some epigenetic things that happen fast. Because epigenetically, you can change in a day. Yeah. You can epigenetically change over a long period of time. Uh, something that would be really fast would be um, uh, battle fatigue, um, where you see such violence, and it affects you, your nervous system so powerfully that you produce a tremendous, uh oh, keep pushing the wrong button a tremendous amount of these types of, of epigenetic markers that then change the way your body may use adrenaline. How do they get produced? Huh? How do they get produced? How does the battle that they produce these? Well, because there's such a dramatic reaction, the amount of adrenaline that's flooded through is so powerful that it changes these histone tails. I don't know, but what's the exact mechanism for it? Well, I, I don't want to go into that one because that's not, that, that's not the issue. It could be, I'll, I'll change it and I'll say, um, uh, you're, you're experimenting and you try crack cocaine. And your genetic material, um, because genetics do still play a major role, is more sensitive to it. And on the very first time, you have such a powerful reaction that you create a whole bunch of these epigenetic markers that mark the way that the brain uses. Well, if I get to specific or scientific now, is it produced by, for instance, hormones? Is it produced well, by what, what is what the epigenetic markers? What how what part of your body creates that? Is it is your brain that is it hormones? Well, is it electrical signals? What you know, what is it that causes right. creates that? Not, I don't know how to quite answer your question. These are methyl groups. This is these are very common in the body. Um, they have a, they have a uh, you can see it, I forget what the exact mechanism is, what they're made of, but it's got a methyl group. And you eat a lot of foods that have methyl groups. Your body uses these to open and to close these. I'll give an example that is not an immediate one. My eyes are blue. These cells keep making my blue iris. But the genetic material on the tip of my nose is identical to the genetic material that's creating the blue eye. What's the difference? It's the way that these histones, these genes are wrapped around and what it allows to be expressed and what it doesn't. So it's a normal function. Epigenetic functions are normal. They go on a billion times uh, a second. They're constant. But what we're talking about is that socially our environment can make changes that are either profound or because they're continued. In the one, because of, a, um, say, the, uh, the crack cocaine and the, the, the way that it affected the body was so powerful that it 
created a whole lot of these lockdown, and it closes this off. So the gene locks this direction, or it opens it up. They do multiple different things. But because of that, now your body, every time that it gets around a certain environmental fa uh, um, factor, has this type of response. They alter the response pattern. What's that? They alter the response pattern. They change the response pattern. They change the neuronal pattern, the neurons, the plasticity that we have. They alter the way the body will produce um, uh, insulin, as an example. Our diets today have so many processed oils and, and processed carbohydrates that we are now, we're having an epigenetic change in the way that we're using insulin. And now we have children at, at, in their teenage years having adult onset diabetes. That was not heard of um, some time ago. And now it's becoming quite common. That would be an epigenetic change. Why? Because it probably was passed on by the parents and maybe the parents, grandparents. Because we started eating uh, these very processed foods in the 40s. And so if you, if you follow that down, and then it's reinforced in the, in the uh, social life. And so if we were to look at, at some of these um, um, genes, we would see that they're locked down, not just with one of these little guys right here, but they'd be locked down all over it. This thing is just real tightly wound, if it was that tight, or completely open when it should have been uh, shut down, or only partially open. Mm. Don't know? Okay, in a nutshell, um, the difference between the histone, the gene, and the histone tail, how do they, how would you incorporate all three of these with the umbrella name of, of epigenetics? And what is the function in a nutshell? What's the difference between the, the function of the histone, the function of the gene, and then the function of the histone tail? Okay. You understand what a gene does. Genes make proteins. And these proteins then become the process by which you replicate other cells. So you need genes to continue growing more hair, to replace the cells in the eyeball, to replace the neurons in the brain. Genes are doing this. And they do it by expressing um, their code that's inside. Each one of these genes are slightly different. You put all those together and you've got, you've got your whole chromosome up here. That has all the DNA and the genes are these parts of that DNA that have very specific functions. The, this process right here is de it determines how much these things can or cannot express, and they're talking back and forth to each other on a constant way. The histone is nothing more than a, a process by which your body can open or close those genes. Otherwise, if these guys weren't here, if these guys weren't here, the histones, these things are totally open, and they would be, it would run them up. This is the gateway. This is the turning on or off. So it's like if I'm telling you, how, do you, how does a computer run? It's got, it's got on and off. It's got one, it's got a zero. And by those manipulations, we have cell phones and we have presentations like this on the screen because it's happening in real fast time. This is even happening on a, on a way more advanced um, point. And the histone tail, that is simply the, the uh, receptor. And it's either gonna, it's gonna grab some of these epigenetic methyl groups or oxyl groups or phosphorylization groups and it's going to then adjust how that gene can function. Now this goes on constantly, but what we found out that becomes so amazing about epigenetics is that we finally realized that our very environment is influencing this. We thought that this was all a process that was encoded in the genes, and it's not. And so what happens is that you know, if you look right here, the, the histone modification, the binding of epigenetic factors to histone tails alters the extent to which DNA is wrapped around histones and the availability of genes in the DNA to be activated. Hmm. And so when we hear the term epigenetic marker, it did, that means how activated that gene in the DNA. And these things close them as well as open them. Like, uh, when we smoke cigarettes, it immediately uh, hits neurons in the brain that closes down some of their functions. And then the body starts to have to produce more of other chemicals, and then we get a, a type of a focus. 
And then that, that cigarette, the, the, those chemicals, um, start to alter the way that our brain works because we've developed a pattern, a habit. And then that habit can be passed on to our progeny. We never thought that. When you start to realize that the things that you do before you have children can affect how your children will utilize the genes that you passed on to them is an amazing thought. Dude. So, uh, this type of uh, lying dormant of uh, epigenetic genes waiting to explode based off of a social experience, experience we might encounter, you can like uh, kind of liken that to like the, the equivalent of a spiritual Christian being born again, and then after experiencing that, every time they have that social engagement with that religion or, or sect, uh, at that point it kind of just uh, multiplies their ability to, to feel that, that feeling once again? Reinforces it. Reinforces it. Epigenetics, um, if you look at the, and I don't want to use the word now epigenetic, I want to look at more of this social interaction, this nurture. The nurturing that we do with each other here, in our communities, in our homes, in our workplace, the things that we find valuable or not valuable. In northern um, Korea, um, what they pass on and is enforced is the worship of the, uh, what's his name? Um, and his father. Huh? No, no, no. Uh, the, uh, Kim. Oh, Kim. Kim, uh, Kim. Kim. Kim Jong Neil. Jong Neil. Jong Neil. Yeah. They, take, they take the children out at, at age four and uh, they rarely get to see their parents and they're indoctrinated. And this becomes very important to these children. That would be a form of manipulating this social inheritance, these epigenetic uh, abilities, and force them into a certain way. Now, when we talk to those as they become adults, those people that become, as they become adults, they don't see and think like we do. But then that's true with every culture. You can't go to a culture where you do not see these, these changes. There's a group of um, people that live on, um, on the ocean. They're, off, off the coast of Malaysia. And they did a brain scan of some of the, of the people there. What do you mean when they, they live on rafts? They, they live on rafts. Water world? Yep. Okay, they, 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 they rarely ever go on to land. Uh, they they, sure they cool. get their food by diving 70, 80 feet. And they can stay down for two times, three times the length of, of, of us. But that's not the amazing part. When we go underwater, we can't see straight. Everything's altered. They see it exactly right. Wow. They, and that is not a genetic change. They epigenetically changed over the last centuries that they've been there. They've been there X amount of centuries. And they actually changed the way that they view what they see underwater. I, I, have, I, I have a good friend who, on Maui, who's a mathematics professor. He wore glasses that were like this thick, Coke bottle glasses. He couldn't see without them. But he'd get underwater. And he could see everything perfectly. So there's a genetic part of that that's also right. Involved. Well, genetics is you can't get away from the genetics. <coughs> Epigenetics is how the genetics gets to be used. <coughs> Just real quick, Rob, I was reading this thing about a year and a half ago in Time Magazine about this epigenetics and this studies that was done up in northern Finland with with uh, they they realized that the genes were modifying much quicker within a generation or two depending on whether it had been feast or famine, and that's when they started realizing there's more going on here than just the genes, it's the markers that do this turning on and turning off. And uh, it was really fascinating to see that what we normally thought would take eons for genes to sort of eventually modify is happening much quicker than we think. That's epigenetics, right? And then they, they interpreted it as some kind of like the fraying of the ed end of your shoestring. Right. And so, it's been a long time since I read the article, but... You're talking about the histones. You're talking about sudden change? Yeah, right. it, by the way, is it... With the, the epigenetics, it doesn't create new coding, it modifies the, the existing coding, right? Right. Okay, so, it, to me, it seems like, you know, when you refer to the Urantia book, the, between direct inheritance and social inheritance, that this would seem more like a direct inheritance. In other words, to me, social inheritance is more like, you know, if you're Chinese and you eat uh, noodles and, and rice, 
it just, it's just part of the culture that gets carried on. It's not really part of your makeup. So that, to me, that would be more of a cultural or social inheritance. Okay. To me, if this is encoded into your physical makeup, it would seem to be part of that direct inheritance that you're actually talking about. If it's encoded in your DNA, it's direct inheritance. No, even if it's modified. No. Yeah, this because it's still, it's still part of your, it's not, it's not a cultural thing. Let me, let me explain. Yeah. Let me explain. It's not direct because it's not in the genes. You will not find it in the genes. But it's modifying the genes. No, it's modifying the expression of the gene. Yeah, so it's still and that can some, be rechanged. Exactly, but it's still direct. That can be changed. That can be changed back and forth. I understand, but you know, you know, I'm talking about the diff that if you distinguish the difference between a cultural inheritance, this is not cultural inheritance. Cultural is like it's all in the brain, like education. Your actual talks about education. If your family is 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 just into believe in education. You don't really have to have a gene modification for that trait to be passed on. How is the trait passed on? Just by uh, <coughs> learning. But what's the mechanism? Well, through your brain cells. You, you well, what's the mechanism of brain cells? Which, you know? well, no, it's not. You can just, it's just like a computer. Like a computer can learn things, right, without genes. You can have a biocomputer that can learn go without ahead, having genes. Go, go ahead and, and look it up, and you're going to find that what you're talking about is right, and it is the changes in the neuron patterns by an epigenetic mechanism. Yes, it, is, it is done by, by this type of stuff I, happening. I understand, but I'm, not I'm, by that's, this. Not, that's not the point. The point is that we're, we're talking about in, interpreting what it says in the Arantula. I can't find that anywhere else. I'm not going to be able to read up on that. May I offer it's, a it's suggestion just, it's, from the Arantula? Let me finish. It's, it's just, I'm, just, I'm just referring to okay. you know, what, what the Arantula says. Can I go on? You're right. You know, so. got Let me just make up one right. sentence uh, lesson from the Arantia book that puts all of this in context. It's Cain and Abel. Let me get to it. You got that covered? Okay. I won't say it. Let, let, let me move on to these things. All right, that's okay. okay. You we guys have a, I have a question. What is the scope of time? Scope of time? Yes. For which? Epigenetically speaking? That you might actually see a difference of the more active DNA. Like, are you talking generations? Oh, for DNA changes, you're certainly not it's, talking it's a millennia. single lifetime. No, genetic changes are millennia. So I mean, you're talking about a huge scope of time. We're not talking about within your lifespan. And, and epigenetics is in your lifetime or and in just a few generations. I think. Approximately eight generations is what they kind of stretch the potential of these types of changes. In other words, um, the fact that you have grandparents that smoked you still will probably be able to find those, Isn't those that genetic markers. It's funny that they smoke. say that societal change generally takes eight years. Uh, so again? Isn't it strange that they say that societal change generally takes eight years for the perception of a society to change on any one given major oh. topic? And then you say that it's eight generations that we have a actual, see, an actual genetic difference difference in I would, what I say is the hyper explanation of Darwin's selection of the fittest. Mm -hmm. could, could we hear Robert's talk? I'll try. I'll Thank see you. if I can if I can get through to this. I mean I understand you got confusions and uh, there's um, uh, this can be a very deep issue. And the more you look into it, here's what I found out after the five years of, of researching it is that I have way, way, way more questions than I have any answers. I actually have a few answers. I just have a heck of a lot of questions that I can see are important for us to figure out. Now, I'll give you one example of um, where this type of stuff socially does make a change. We have a thing called um, hyperactivity disorders, AHAD, ADHC. And they're wondering why something like that can happen. Now, they, they haven't exactly said it's epigenetic, but they're starting to realize that what's happening with television is that when television first came on, they would just have a scene that would be there for quite a while. And then they'd have another scene and then another angle. What's happening to TV today? Do you know how many changes happen just in a minute? Boom, boom, boom. And they're doing things where the camera shudders. <clears throat> a noise. What they're doing is they're making us focus, focus, because of these long hours, we're actually habituating ourselves into these epigenetic changes, wow. and it's taking away our ability to critically think. Wow. Well, we, we get bored, is what happens. 
And so the faster that they can make these switches, watch your next time, just take a look at news. Watch how fast these things, they'll never discuss anything for very long. Then we have a few news things where they will get into it and they talk about it for two or three minutes. And that's about as long as we have developed a culture, um, not individually, but as a culture. That's an epigen epigenetic change. But there's another thing that comes out of that. Do you know that we're much more capable of multitasking than we ever have ever? I believe that. And, and you see us doing it, and got our little mobile things, and we, we multitask continually because that's one of the things that we're also being epigenetically pushed to. There's goods and bads with all these different things. Um, so what's another one? Uh, children born where there's a tremendous amount of stress, like in our inner cities, or in Beirut, or um, Lebanon, where the stress and fear is constant. They are epigenetically changed and it can take generations for those, for those epigenetic things on the tails of those histones to completely disappear. So what that means is that we can go in and teach young girls in Bihar, India to read. But the changes are going to have to be consistent for generations. There's no quick fixes. That's what is important about understanding this. It's quick when I look at it from genetic points of view. But culturally, we're thinking that, hey, if I teach this, this society to read that the change is immediate. Well, remember I brought up Scotland. I did that because there was an immediate change, but when did the real change take place? A few generations later. Well, in 10 years, they were considered the most literate, but not much was done with it. It was the it was decades after that where a couple of generations happened, and then an explosion, and the humanities came out of Scotland, and in scientific and in engineering, it was really an amazing process that took place because it does take time for these to be in culture to such a level that they, that they have a power. So when we watch so much TV or we eat so much sugar or we any of these things and the culture, our society reinforces it, you're going to see these types of changes that then are going to take generations to change even if we get people to completely stop. Now, individually, you can do some wonderful changes. Go ahead and hit that next one. DNA contains the instructions for building all the parts of the body. But DNA is only half the story. The DNA in our bodies is wrapped around proteins called histones. Both the DNA and histones are covered with chemical tags. This second layer of structure is called the epigenome. The epigenome shapes the physical structure of the genome. It tightly wraps inactive genes, making them unreadable. It relaxes active genes, making them easily accessible. Different sets of genes are active in different cell types. The DNA code remains fixed for life, but the epigenome is flexible. Epigenetic tags react to signals from the outside world, such as diet and stress. The epigenome adjusts specific genes in our genomic landscape in response to our rapidly changing environment. epigenetic inheritance and then that child has reproductive cells they've already been altered 
And then if this child smokes, these are even more reinforced. So what you end up with is these, these uh, epigenomes laden with certain markers that are passed on for a certain amount of generations. But if, if that child doesn't smoke and doesn't marry a spouse that smokes, they start to be less until two, three, four, five, up to eight generations, and those markers are as if they never were. There was a, um, and I was trying to find the, because I, I knew somebody was going to ask me what, what exactly was it and I couldn't find it. But there was a, a, a study done where they took mice, uh, genetically the same, they put them in two different environments. Both of them were fed, uh, slept, everything was the same and it was ideal for rats. They had plenty of things to run on and so <coughs> forth. But the one group got uh, electric shocks at random times, randomly got shocked when they slept, when they ran on the wheel, when they were getting water, just little mild shocks that kept their nervous system jumping. They go down four generations, and the mice that are being born are just jumping, I mean, right from the get-go, even if they weren't being shocked. Eight generations, they were quite the mess. They went eight generations with this test. And then they switched. The ninth generation that were being shocked were no longer shocked, and the, the ninth generation that were, um, it was the reverse. And what happens is four generations down from there, they can't tell which mice is which. Now you gotta know that, the, that those one group of mice hadn't been shot for four generations, and the other ones had only been shot for four generations. They were really hard to tell, and by eight generations, the one that came from the original shot group did not have those, those uh, traits, nor did they have the epigenetic markers, because they actually uh, would go in and find these, these uh, markers on their genes, and watch how they accumulated. So it gives an idea of how these things accumulate and, and break down. Now this was a very intense type of a, of a test because they're, they're reinforcing it very heavy, both sets of parents, so they took it all the way. We don't really have those ideal situations in the environment, or it's rare for us to have it. Let me put it. For a TV, the world is thinking. But the very last chapter of my book is about epigenetics. And that's a new science that some of you may have read, at, read about. And uh, epigenetics is about, uh, is another way of looking at, at how genes are expressed and, and at this kind of crazy idea, which has now been proven to be absolutely true, at least in, in some cases, and seems to be more and more widespread the more scientists look at it. In that, um, although we don't, uh, the, the genes that, we, that parents pass to their children are exactly the same. They, they stay intact. Um, there's a wrapping that goes around those genes that also passes from parent to children and that greatly influences gene expression. And that actually does change and can be altered by the environment. Which is to say, crazily as it's crazy as it sounds, that um, things that we do in our life, which can impact the epigenome before we have kids, then we'll get passed on to our kids and will subsequently affect their own gene expression. So decisions that we make, decisions that I make, or I should say that I made before I had kids, affected not the genes, but the epigenome around uh, the genes that I passed on and, and will have an effect and, and are having an effect on my own kids' lives, which I can't, I wouldn't expect anyone to just accept uh, at face value. It's, it sounds crazy, it is crazy, it brings up the whole notion of Lamarck, who um, even bef long before Darwin suggested that, that, um, that behaviors and experience actually change our genes, and actually that turns out to be really close to true in some ways. So I've been doing a little bit of inculcation to try to reinforce some of these things. Cain and Abel. Um, this is out of the Naranja book. I'm sure that most of you kind of remember it. But the, the things that really came out is that the observation of Abel's conduct establishes the value of environment and education as factors in character development. Abel had an ideal inheritance, and heredity lies at the bottom of all character, but the influence of an inferior environment virtually neutralized this magnificent inheritance. 
Abel, especially during his younger years, was greatly influenced by his unfavorable surroundings. He would have become an entirely different person had he lived to be 25 or 30. His superb, superb inheritance would then have shown itself. While a good environment cannot contribute much toward really overcoming the character handicaps of a base heredity, a bad environment can very effectively spoil an excellent inheritance, at least during the younger years of life. Good social environment and proper education are indispensable soil and atmosphere for getting the most out of good inheritance. So they're not letting us off the hook genetically, but at the same time they're starting to show how important uh, our environment is. You've got to remember that, that uh, uh, Abel was pure blood Adonic. I mean, you can't get better genetics than what he had, and yet he was bellicose, uh, he was a difficult person to be around, and the environment uh, so influenced not just him, but look what was happening, where was, where was Adam and Eve? I mean, these are material sons and daughters. They are bright parents, but they give excuses because they said, uh, uh, <clears throat> Adam was so busy taking care of countless details that he couldn't really see to the spiritual training of, of his children. Would you say that Abel was teasing Cain in the yeah. context of we have teasing now on the internet and social networks that drive kids to suicide? And these would be, these are the things that are epigenetically functioning within us. Go ahead and click that. <clears throat> What's that? Yeah, well, Abel was teasing Cain all the time. Yeah. Did I have that backwards? Yeah. 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 Abel was teasing Cain all the time. That's what I, that's what I meant to say. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, and then Cain just finally had enough. Yeah. That's what yeah. he said. But you've got to also remember that Cain had, had some incredible said. inheritance too. Right. He was half Adamic and then half Nodic. No yeah. Which is some of the best blood that was on this planet. He wanted some good, clean genes. That was it. So he was also so badly influenced by that. Um, by the environment. Now, on a neighboring planet, I'm going to uh, have a few things to read on here. Microphone. Oh, yeah, microphone. <laughs> uh, I pull this part off. This recital of the affairs of a neighboring planet is made by special permission with the intent of advancing civilization and augmenting governmental evolution on Urantia. Much more could be narrated that would no doubt interest and intrigue Urantians, but this disclosure covers the limits of our permissive mandate. I really wish they would give us more. <laughs> but on home sites, they say on this continent, it is against the law for two families to live under the same roof. They're making epigenetic changes there. They're forcing it. Kind of like the law that they had to learn to read the Bible and stuff. And since group dwellings have been outlawed, most of the tenement type of buildings have been demolished. But the unmarried still live in clubs, hotels, and other group dwellings. The smallest home site permitted must provide 50,000 square feet of land. That's about an acre, a little over an acre. All land and other property used for home purposes are free from taxation up to 10 times the minimum home allotment. They're making it um, a very positive experience. If you're going to have children, a family, you have to be in a single dwelling, and it has to have enough space around you. They're really forcing the environment to be conducive. Parental schools. The home life of these people, of this people, has greatly improved during the last century. So a century is about about four generations. Attendance of parents, both fathers and mothers, at the parental schools of child culture is compulsory. So again, they're forcing issues. They're creating patterns that are epigenetic in nature. Even the agriculturists who reside in small country settlements carry on this work by correspondence, going to the nearby centers for oral instruction once in 10 days, every two weeks where they maintain a five-day week. I just like that whole book. I didn't catch it the first time I saw it. Ha, ha. It's probably not a real picture, but probably not. It's hanging upside down, right? <laughs> Home life. These people, these people, regard the home as the basic institution of their civilization. 
it is expected that the most valuable part of a child's education and character training will be secured from his parents and at home. And fathers devote almost as much attention to child culture as mothers. And I remember the one gentleman that was talking before, he was saying that we, we need to be able to make changes. The Urantia book is saying that this culture on this one continent, on a neighboring planet, we're making these changes. And if, you know, if you remember the whole story, their crime rate just has dropped dramatically uh, just in the last century. So four generations, they have made incredible changes. Again, I just have a picture. <laughs> educational system. The educational system of this nation is compulsory and co-educational in the pre-college <coughs> schools that the student attends from the ages of 5 to 18. These schools are vastly different from those on, of Urantia. There are no classrooms. Only one study is pursued at a time, and after the first three years, all pupils become assistant teachers, instructing those below them. Books are used only to secure information that will assist in solving the problems arising in the school shops and on the school farms. Much of the furniture used on the continent and uh, the many me mechanical contrivances, this is a great age of invention and mechanization, are produced in these shops. Adjacent to each shop is a working library where the student may consult the necessary reference books. Agriculture and horticulture are also taught throughout the entire educational period, period on the extensive farms adjoining every local school. Yeah, they had the internet. <laughs> and you know, what, what's, what we're talking about here is that the world has what they are valuing. And they started valuing home life. It became their most important institution. You can see how this social nurturing, be it epigenetic or otherwise, is extremely powerful in being able to take this culture and change them radically because they share the basic genetics of all the other peoples on that world, but they say those, were, those um, civilizations are quite backward and bellicose. Now, they have a social disgust, and I really like this. What do we socially find disgusting? Well, it. How about um, child abuse? Mm -hmm. How about beating women? Mm -hmm. Human trafficking. Human trafficking. I mean, we, are, we find this very, very disgusting when we come up with a whole bunch of other things. And we, as a rule, share that as being disgusting behavior. And because of it, it keeps it um, down. It doesn't stop it, but it keeps it down. Now, we don't really do as much as we probably should um, once we uh, convict people of these disgusting crimes. But there, there is social disgust. These people are also beginning to foster a new form of social disgust. Disgust for both the idleness and unearned wealth. For the, the, for the very poor that aren't willing to do anything and for the very wealthy that have too much. Slowly but certainly, they are conquering their machines. Once they, too, struggle for political liberty and subsequently for economic freedom, now they are entering upon the enjoyment of both, while in addition, they are beginning to appreciate their well-earned leisure, which can be devoted to increased self-realization. I mean, sometimes we get lucky enough to be able to retire, and then we can start spending time on that type of a pursuit but our society today, uh, all around the world, is moving to where more and more people are going to have to work until well beyond the years. There's a uh, similar to a 65. Um, for us, it's moving into the 70s and 80s. My mother-in-law, I mean, we just had to stop her working at 83. My dad worked until he was 74. My mom worked until she was 70, which wasn't too bad. And the reason that this is not good as a social uh, nurturing is that uh, our children, that home life, the parents, the grandparents, are all an important factor of that because that's where some of the best of the nurturing is, is happening. So in conclusion, um, everything else now. what is important to me here is that we begin to explore these sciences more. It's great that science on its own is finding it. I mean, uh, the Urantia book has spoken of it in a very, very general terms, saying genetics are the most important. But 
the biggest changes happened because of social change. The Garden of Eden was as idyllic a lifestyle as you could have. And in that much time, it went to be an extremely rugged life. The second garden was no garden to speak of. And um, that caused tremendous amount of epigenetic changes. We have opportunities in our own home lives. I mean, at least if we're aware of that, we do everything we can to make the very best home lives that we can for those that we love. I've got, I've got grandchildren, I'm thinking, hmm, I've got to start doing everything I can to have a, a solid home life. Not unearned leisure or unearned wealth, but to be able to be nurtured and cared and loved and the values that, that we would like to um, be passed on to make sure that they value that. That is epigenetics. Thank you. Question. Take the microphone to the question. Okay. Uh, well, I understood about epigenetics was that it was strictly, um, it was strictly impinging on the biological organism of a, of a human being. And you touched so much tonight on educational and spiritual and other things that we can do that impact epigenetics. And I, I really thought it was just biological. In the end, it is biological because it's how we change the, uh, our, our biology, our genes. But if we, let's say that our, in our family life, we make it important that we meditate. So for, so for example, stress impinges on biology. That's sort of a approach. Exactly. Okay. And prayer, meditation, in, in, impinges on how our biology, our genetic biology works. Activity or the lack of activity impinges. It all does. And now what we need is to be able to have help on identifying what are the really important things that need to be done and how can we socially enhance it. An example I'm seeing in where I live is, you know, kids aren't allowed to skateboard. they got to go to the parks, but if the parents can't take them, it's too far. And everyone's yelling at them not to climb trees. And uh, so the only thing you have is organized sports. And I'm going, you know, this is, well, organized, nothing wrong with organized sports, but we've got to let our kids have activities. And if we take that away, then they just end up going into the room and they start playing video games and wiring their brain that way. So. Yeah, we have all of these implications from epigenetics. That's very fascinating, to say the least, first of all, Robert. Um, if we are retarded <laughs> as, a, yeah. as a planet, <laughs> morally, epigenetically, in comparison to the, the planet that you gave an example of, um, <clears throat> How can we, you know, what are the best things in your mind that we can do on an individual level and then a corporate level to, to break free from the things that hold us captive, so to speak? Um, I know that's... I understand the question. In yeah, 10 words or less. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> there, there, that's, that's one of those things when I say I have thousands more questions than I got any answers. You just had a mouthful of them there. There is so much that we need to consider. and there, there is no simple <coughs> answer. There are answers to this. That world, they say, genetically was not a whole lot different than us. That, that we're not, we are not, we're not more backwards than them in that way. Now, maybe I'm infusing the words into it, but that's what I got by reading the paper a couple of times over. They gave us that information because we are similar enough to them and to show what types of changes can be had when you really took some action. I mean, for their most serious crimes, what happens to the people? You know? Abandonment. They get shut out. It's well, serious crimes. It's in the island. Oh, death. Yeah. Far death. Oh, we carry the drug. Uh, public trust is the death penalty. Yeah, death penalty. Right. If you misadminister the Social Security funds which are derived from the mineral resources of the planet. So, uh, if, it, if it's less offensive, then you, you go and live in, in communities that are designed and you can earn your way out of that. These are tough. I mean, can you see that going over in the United States or any other? What, hanging politicians? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but see, these tough decisions 
are, are needed to be able to start making these changes. Do we have the will? I, I don't know. I mean, I, my brain can't even begin to wrap around it. But the things I know I can do is to develop the best family life of all those around me. My friends, my friends' grandkids, to become involved with them in a way that is helpful. And that in itself is one thing that can be done. Help children read in other countries, free, uh, free schools. That makes a change. Is it making the huge change we're talking about here? No, but any good change is worth the effort. So we just gotta be able to make the changes as we, as we see fit. And if there becomes a collective group that is willing to really study this and come up with wise counsel, that would be wonderful. Right now, we're gonna to listen to who, the politicians? You know, even our universities are only studying this on a certain level, but at least they are moving very rapidly. But also remember, this whole study is less than 10 years old. And Wayne, what did you say? It takes eight years before you even start to, before it even starts to become in the beginning of accepting. Eight years or eight generations? Eight, eight years for sociological. For sociological. And uh, so this, this, is a, this was a real bender for everybody 10 years ago. That's why you're starting to feel so, I mean, many of you have heard of it on some, you've read some books on it. That's because we're in the 10th, 11th year of this, and it's just now starting to really take off. The next 10 years are going to be phenomenal on what people learn. All right, one more question. I probably should let, we got to go. Yeah, just a, just a comment. Uh, yeah, I've done some reading on epigenetics, too, about as much as you have, but some of the, the, the uh, things that I, uh, I think they have, maybe you can, you can help me, maybe they have discovered these things. One of the things that I read that they haven't really figured out was to what extent a certain behavior affects the genes. For instance, that, you know, that person smoking a cigarette, is just one cigarette going to make them, is it going to take two cigarettes a day, is it going to take a pack a day for 10 years? We don't really know exactly how much of our activity will actually affect our genes yet. I don't, have they figured that out? No, 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 no yet. And I think one of the things that's important is now we know with this and other studies, discoveries, for instance, that free will, you know, for instance, one of the things that they found out was that through meditation and concentration, we can actually, we can create brain cells and, and you know, it's a kind of a clinical evidence that free will is, is an actuality. This is another one of those evidences that we can actually change not just ourselves, but our culture and our environment and our civilization by the things that we do. And not just intellectually, but biologically. We can do those things. And that's, I think that's a big <clears throat> advance in our civilization, that we have this power and it empowers us that we can do these good things. And it's not just a momentary thing. It's going to last. It's going to go on. You know, and I think that's a, that's a great uh, discovery. That is probably one of the most powerful things to date that have come out of epigenetics because we used to believe that we are controlled by our genes. It's in your genes and you can't do anything about it. That was a very mechanistic viewpoint. And now we realize that while these genes do are the card deck that we have to deal with, we're able to play those, those cards in a variety of ways. And we are in control of that if we so wish to take it. So you can change uh, many, I mean, we do know how to change many of these, uh, good and bad. Um, you want to make a big epigenetic change? Start writing with your non-dominant hand. Nice. Nice A's and B's and C's with your left hand or your right hand, depending on what's dominant. Do you know what just, and only write with that. You cannot write with the other hand for one month. It's amazing the, the process they've done the brain scans. Absolutely incredible. Now, what benefit does that have to you? You start to have increased visual, you have increased auditory. They don't quite know why, they just know that all of a sudden that's happened because you did something that was really odd. It breaks a type of plasticity, a, a neural bonding that we have with your dominant, forces it to the other, and that crossing over change is remarkable in, in how it affects us. Just real quick, instead of having to you know, write everything with your non-dominant hand, which would be pretty difficult, you can even just brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand. And that is supposed to even help increase your willpower. Yep. And these are the things that we're, we're rapidly finding. So you know, it's an exciting time to be alive. 
and you're ready to cut. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we have to open the chair.